Private Monica Brown is only the second woman to be awarded the Silver Star since the Second World War. She's an army medic who risked her own life to save two critically wounded paratroopers with the 82nd Airborne Division in Afghanistan. Under army regulations, women cannot be assigned to frontline combat units. But in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq today, that's exactly where they often end up. Some male soldiers aren't so happy about that, including members of Private Brown's own unit. But her superior officers say she's a hero, a hero who earned one of the military's highest awards for exceptional valor when she was only 18 years old. This is a big deal. Winning, you know, the Silver Star is a big deal for anybody. And winning it at your age is an even bigger deal. It's overwhelming. <laughs> you're being treated like a superstar, really. Yeah. And you're just a kid. Yeah, I am just a child. It all started on April 25, 2007. Private Brown was temporarily attached to a paratrooper unit in Paktika province, a hostile and remote area. The unit was headed back to base after searching for weapons in a village. None of them had any idea they were driving straight into a massive ambush until a roadside bomb exploded under the last Humvee and hidden enemy fighters unleashed mortars and machine guns on the convoy. Private Brown had had just four months of medic training, and it was her first firefight. They stopped the convoy, and my platoon sergeant got out of the truck and said, Doc, let's go. And in that situation right then, you were the only medic? Mm -hmm. So really, it was up to you? Yes. There was a, a ball of fire that went into the truck and burned all five crew members. The gunner was actually almost blown out of the turret. Michael Green was Private Brown's Sergeant Major with the 82nd Airborne Division. What did Monica do? What was remarkable about her actions? She grabbed her aid bag, got out of the truck, and made her way back to uh, the vehicle. And through, through small arms fire, intense small arms fire and mortar fire. As I'm running, I see guys rolling in the dirt trying to put their uniforms out because they're burning. Sergeant Jose Santos was running with Private Brown towards the casualties through a hail of enemy bullets and mortar fire. Sergeant Aaron Best, a gunner in the lead Humvee, was firing back at the enemy, while Specialist Jack Bodani, only lightly wounded, managed to crawl out of the burning Humvee. I thought I lost my entire crew at that point in time. I didn't see anybody. Bodani knew that his best friend, Specialist Stanson Smith, was still trapped inside the burning vehicle that was packed with high explosive ammunition. Couldn't get him out because he was trying to crawl on the flames and he's disoriented and got adrenaline pumping. And he's, he's been hit at this point, right? His head is hit quite badly. Blood all over his face and burned skin and his lips were messed up. The truck is carrying the, the Mach 19, which has 40 millimeter grenades. So you're talking about a thousand grenades inside that truck. Plus and they all went off? And they're all going off, yeah. It sounded like firecrackers at first, and then it was pretty heavy after that because you could hear the 50 cows going off and stuff like that. As the firefight raged on, Private Brown focused on the two most seriously wounded men, Specialist Larry Spray and Specialist Smith. You know, I see Smith, and he's laying there, you know, he's rocking back and forth, and at this, you know, I like look, I'm like, oh crap, you know, he's dead. Spray, his hands are all burned up, and uh, his face is burned up. And in all of this, I mean, you were never scared, not even for a moment? I wasn't scared for my life. I was scared because I was afraid I wasn't going to be competent and able to do my job um, because I knew the people that were hurt. You were scared of failing? Yeah. Private Brown's instincts kicked in with bullets whizzing by and mortars exploding around her. This young woman, who was not even supposed to be in frontline combat, threw her body over the wounded paratroopers to protect them. It was an uncontrollable situation. I just, I dove over Spray, because Spray can't defend himself. It's not like he can go anywhere to take cover. So I dove over him, make sure he didn't get any shrapnel or anything from it. Then while still under fire, Sergeant Santos and Private Brown dragged the injured men into a pickup truck. Brown once again covered them with her body as Santos drove them to an area where they could be treated. 
At first, I thought that Smith was the most critical because, you know, he had a laceration on his forehead and it was pretty deep and I didn't know if he had any brain injury. He was in a lot of pain? Yes. Did some pain control on him at first and then went over to spray. I didn't have enough gauze in my aid bag to wrap up as many burns as he had. That's how bad it was. So he could have died? He could have, yeah. So what happened next? And the medevac bird came in, and then it all hit me, you know, what had just happened. And, you know, I could have died, and those guys could have died. And I can't believe this just happened. All this stuff was just, like, rushing to me. And what did you do? I threw up. <laughs> you did? I did, yeah. I have a daughter her age, and it's just kind of, it kind of floors me at times to, to think about my daughter in that situation. And Monica's... A, a, just a genuine and f fantastic person. Sergeant Major Green and Colonel Martin Schweitzer, Monica Brown's former brigade commander, both recommended that she be awarded the Silver Star. What impressed them as much as her bravery was her modesty. We asked uh, specialist then Private Brown, you know, why'd you do it? Just trying to get inside her psyche that, you know, she uh, uh, you know, put herself at that kind of risk. What did she say? Her answer was just plain as day and looked at me and Sergeant Major like we were crazy to even ask that question. And she said, it's my job. And it's just powerful. Powerful. We need a litter! But female soldiers aren't supposed to be doing their jobs in frontline combat units, according to the Army's own regulations. To get around that, the Army says it temporarily attaches women to combat units, but does not permanently assign them. Women are not supposed to be, according to the, you know, the strict guidelines, are yeah. not supposed to well, be on front line the, of the, combat. We do not assign our female soldiers to the infantry and the armor. We do attach female soldiers to units for a specific mission for a specific period of time, absolutely in accordance with uh, Army policy. Basically, anywhere you are in Iraq or Afghanistan <clears throat> yeah, that, is the front line. That's a great question. Anywhere you go outside of a Ford operating base, you, you can you know, run into the threat or a threat. The Army has very strict rules about um, women not being on the front line. And, I mean, there's no question that you are on the front line. There is no front line in Afghanistan or Iraq. You go out on missions, as whether it be humanitarian aid or you know, help building schools or pulling support for another unit while they're building roads or searching for Taliban. You go out there and you do your job and you don't know what's gonna happen. Anything could happen. More than a hundred American women have died so far in Iraq and Afghanistan. Over 600 have been wounded and countless more like Monica Brown have been tested on the battlefield. What did you think when you heard that she covered the wounded with her body? It's just incredible. You just look back and you're just in awe. Do you think um, those, the two most critically wounded, Smith and Spray, do you think they are alive today because, partly because of Monica's actions? Without yeah, a doubt. Absolutely. Absolutely. But both of those men, Specialists Smith and Spray, declined to give us an interview. When we asked why, Smith said flat out, women have no business being on the front line. The men who did talk to us didn't feel that way and said Private Brown performed as well as any man on the battlefield. Did you feel like, okay, she can handle this? Definitely, definitely. And was she very calm, very oh, focused? Definitely, definitely. The whole time, the whole time. But it's these men all questioned whether Private Brown acted any more heroically than the men that day. And they suggested she may have been awarded her Silver Star because she's a woman. People ask you, know, like, was she a superhero? Did she do anything, you know, super, superwoman, super her heroic? No, she did her, her job, job, and she did a very, very good job doing it. Now, the fact that she was 18 and, you know, a female and all, you know, that adds something to it. Private Brown says she never heard any complaints from the men in the unit and says she never asked for or expected special treatment. I never expected them to carry my bags. I can carry my own weight. I expected to be treated like one of the guys, so that's how I got treated like one of the guys. You wanted to be treated like I did. Like you are, just like any of the other guys. Some of the guys may not feel that way. Um, I've never heard any difference. Never? No. Her performance and her actions that day were phenomenal. They were heroic, and they were uh, properly acknowledged. Those kids are alive today. I think that, that says it all. The Silver Star is presented to Specialist Monica Brown.
Vice President Cheney presented Monica Brown with her silver star in Afghanistan. And later, President Bush took time out to meet with her. I got really nervous before he walked in, and he like he sat down on the couch and he was like, "So, Special Brown, how are you from Texas?" I was like, "Yes, sir." <laughs> I was like, "I actually played your hometown volleyball team in high school." And he's like, "Really?" And that's kind of like what sparked the conversation. So you enjoyed meeting him? Yeah, that was awesome. Meeting the president was not something this young girl ever thought would happen to her, especially after the rough start she had growing up in a small town in Texas. She was raised by her grandmother and barely knew her parents, moving around a lot as the family struggled to get by. How many different schools did you go to? Nine. <laughs> was it kind of unstable? Um, yeah, I guess. Our, our, I don't know. I don't have a really good relationship with my mom. Um, Why is that? We just weren't really close when I was growing up. What about your dad? Um, no, I didn't even meet him until I was 13. You didn't meet your father until you were 13 years old? No. Why? He was in jail. For what? Do you know? Uh, drug use and distribution. Dealing drugs? Um, yeah, and using them. With her father in jail and her mother rarely around. This is my grandmother, Katie. Hi, Katie. Monica's grandmother was the one who was there for her, just as she was this past summer when their hometown of Lake Jackson threw a huge celebration in Monica Brown's honor. So there you are, riding in a limo. Yeah, I got to ride in a limo. They flew me all around town, and then I got to land next to the school. They threw a parade for me. They had a parade, <laughs> and people were like, oh, we're so proud of you. It's just weird for me. I don't want any special treatment. I don't even care for recognition. I don't expect any of those things. I did my job. I didn't ask for this award. You know, if I could take that entire day back, I would.